Greetings dear students and welcome to the clinical parasitology lecture. So in this video we will be discussing the nematodes or what we call the roundworms. So here are the learning objectives for this topic. So the first one is to identify correctly and describe the characteristics and diagnostic features of parasites, especially the parasites with clinical importance. So here we'll be talking about the morphology on a brief level. The extensive or intensive discussion will be focused on the laboratory. Next is to discuss the pathology. So for lecture, our main uh, goal here is to discuss the pathology or the diseases that this particular parasite cause. Next is to describe also the life cycle. So how the particular parasite develop from a single egg to multiple adult worms. And lastly, we'll also be talking about the importance of treatment and prevention and control of parasitic infections. Here is the topic overview for our lecture. So your nematodes are divided into two classifications based on the location of their adults in the human host. So for this week, we'll talk about the intestinal nematodes, which basically uh, talks about the roundworms that inhabit the large and small intestine. While on the following meeting, We'll talk about the tissues, extraintestinal, and zoonotic nematodes. By the way, zoonotic means these are nematodes that uh, inhabit or affect animals. So we'll talk about the general characteristics, mode of transmission, uh, their clinical significance or uh, diseases they cause, their life cycle or development, and also how to treat and prevent this particular parasite. So if you still remember our discussion in the introduction to parasitology, we discussed the meaning of metazoans. So metazoans are eukaryotic multicellular organisms. Example of this would be humans, animals, or animals in general, and of course the clinically significant parasites that we'll be discussing in our course. So your metazoans are divided into two phylum. We have the phylum nematelmids and phylum platyhelmids. Nema, which means round, hell means, which means worm. So phylum, round worms. While for platy, which means flat, and hell means, which means worms. So flat worms for phylum, platy, hell means. So under phylum, plat, uh, nematel means, we have one class, and this is what we call the class nematoda or nematodes. So your nematodes are divided based on their location of their adults and also uh, subclass into two types. We have the subclass Adenophorea and subclass Cesernantia, which we'll be discussing later on. So let's have a quick recap of the meaning or description of metazoans. So metazoans or animals are eukaryotic multicellular organisms. So they belong to the kingdom Animalia, which are mostly bilaterally symmetrical. So when we say bilaterally symmetrical, they're a left and right uh, portions are similar, no? So, uh, just like humans. They also show division of labor, which means that these particular organisms usually have a male and female counterpart. So, there is a division of labor. And also, uh, unlike plants, which are under protozoans, these animal cells or their cells lack a cell wall. Okay? So without further ado, let's start our discussion to nematodes or what we call the roundworms. So only few are parasitic to humans. So some are natural parasites of animals, but sometimes may be accidentally acquired by humans. So let's talk about the morphology or diagnostic characteristics of nematodes. So nematodes are so-called roundworms because they are elongated, cylindrical, with unsegmented bodies tapering on both ends. So unlike tapeworms, which have portions in their bodies, your roundworms are completely unsegmented. In terms of the sexes for nematodes, these are separated. So there is a male and female counterpart. This is also what we call dioecious. They also have anteroposterior axis, which is a line that runs from the head or mouth of an organism to the tail or opposite end of the organism, just like here on this picture. So the line or the invisible line that runs through the organism or parasite is what makes them bilaterally symmetrical. So this divides the organism into two portions. 
Remember, for nematodes, they have complete digestive and reproductive system, but no circulatory and respiratory system. So here is a simple differentiation between a male and female adult worm. For nematodes, female adult worms are relatively larger than the male counterpart. While for their, their reproductive system, just like humans, they also have parts to help them uh, sexually reproduce. So remember the addition of reproductive organs. This is unique to the parasites. No? They're copulatory spicules or bursa for male adult worms. So these spicules or bursa are used to attach themselves to the female worm during sexual reproduction. In terms of the tail, female adult worm have straight or pointed tail, while males have curved with spicules or bursa. So here is an example. So as you can see, the larger adult worm is the female worm with usually a pointed straight tail, while for the smaller uh, male adult worm, they have what we call the bursa or spicules, which uh, they use to attach themselves to the female worm during reproduction. So here is the complete anatomy of female and male adult worms. So as you can see, the tail are very evident in this picture. So the smaller size is the male counterpart with a curved tail. While for female, they have a pointed tail and also larger in size compared to the male counterpart. So all of this particular anatomy will be discussed further in the laboratory. So here are the classifications of adult female worms based on their capability to produce eggs. So the first one is oviparous. So these particular female worms lay their egg unsegmented or unembryonated. So that means upon being released by the female worm, the eggs needs to further develop outside the host to complete their life cycle. Usually, these are in the soil or in a moist watery soil example of this we have hat or the acronym hat hookworm ascaris and trichuris all of these parasites are soil transmitted worms or helminths so they are released by the female worm underdeveloped while the ovoviviparous females these are female worms that lay their eggs segmented already so that means these are developed eggs already so example of this, we have the ES or Enterobis vermicularis and Strongyloides stercoralis. So these two parasites lay their developed egg outside the host or even inside, causing auto-infection. So that means their particular life cycle may continue even without going out to the host or going outside the host. And lastly, we have the viviparous or larviparous female worms. So these are worms that lays, instead of an egg, fully developed larva. So example of these are your tissue nematodes, which will be discussed in the next meeting. So aside from the classification of the adult based on their location in the host, intestinal or extra-intestinal, your nematodes are also classified based on their capability to contain chemoreceptors. So when you say chemoreceptors, these are specialized cells that detect chemical substances that can relay information to the parasite. So these chemoreceptors are attached within the parasite to help them navigate their way throughout the host. Normally, your chemoreceptors are divided into two classifications. So the first one, we have the ampids. So when we say ampids, these are cephalic chemoreceptors. So pag sinabi natin cephalic, that means these chemoreceptors are attached or located within the anterior portion of our parasite. So, A ampids for anterior, A for anterior. So, cephalic chemoreceptors are located anteriorly in the host or sorry, in the parasite. So, remember all nematodes have ampid. While the next one, phasmids, these are caudal. So, this is usually located at the tail region or posterior region of our parasite. So, P for posterior or caudal. So remember, all nematodes have pasmids except for the three uh, nematodes included in this slide. So we have TCT, 
trichuris, capillaria, and trichinella, all of these three are what we call apasmid, so absence of pasmid. So that uh, what separates or classified them from the other nematodes. In terms of their life cycle, most of these particular parasites uh, undergo three morphological phase, uh, phases. We have the eggs or the ova, the larva, and the adult worm. So here is a good uh, example of these forms. So in this picture, as you can see, we have the ascaris, a uh, fertilized corticated ascaris egg, while the second picture uh, shows the larva, okay, hatching from the egg, and the last picture shows the adult worm, which are usually whitish to pinkish in color and are elongated. So, just like we have discussed a while ago, your nematodes are grouped on the basis of the habitat of their adult worms. Example of this, we have the intestinal and extra-intestinal roundworms or nematodes. We can also classify them based on their capability to have pasmid or posterior chemoreceptors. So, here are all the parasites that we'll be discussing for today. So, uh, under subclass Sucernentia or pasmids or parasite that contain posterior chemoreceptors, we have Ascaris, Enterobius, Hookworms, and Strongyloides. Under Apasmid or subclass Adenophorea, intestinal roundworms include your Trichuris and Capillaria philippinensis. So, to understand the location of their adults, uh, kindly remember the acronym NASA or kindly include C. So the whole acronym is C-NASA which stands for Capillaria Philippinensis, Necator, Ancelostoma, Strongyloides, and Ascaris. All of these inhabit the small intestine of humans. While for the large intestine, we have the Enterobius and Trichuris which stands for ET. For tissue and extra-intestinal roundworms, under subclasses Cernentia or Phasmids, only filarial worms and Dracunculus medinensis are considered human parasites. While the rest, under Phasmids or Cernentia, these are zoonotic or parasites of animals. Under the subclass Adenophorea, we only have one particular um, import, uh, clinically important parasite and that would be the Trichinella spiralis. This is both a human and zoonotic parasite. So without further ado, let's start our discussion regarding intestinal nematodes. So there are various ways by which we can acquire these types of uh, worms or helminths. And one of the modes of transmission for these parasites is through ingestion of their embryonated eggs. Usually, this includes Ascaris, Trichuris, and Enterobius. For skin penetration, we can include here the hookworms and strongyloides. So without further ado, let's start our discussion under intestinal roundworms. So the most common intestinal nematode of man is Ascaris lumbricoides. So this is also known as the giant roundworm, large intestinal roundworm, or eelworm. So this particular parasite occurs more frequently in the tropics. Example of a tropical country is the Philippines. So it is estimated that more than 1 billion worldwide are infected with 70% of the cases contributes from Asia. So this is also known as a soil transmitted helminth together with hookworm and trichuris. So that means that the soil plays a major role in the development and transmission of this particular parasite. There are also sources or references that say that Ascaris lumbricoides produces PI3 or what we call the pepsin inhibitor 3. So this protects the parasite from digestive juices from our stomach. Also, it produces phosphocorylene which uh, inhibits the lymphocyte proliferation. So it decreases the um, multiplication of white blood cells within the area where the parasite is in. In terms of their forms, your Ascaris, just like all the nematodes that will be discussed here, undergoes three morphological changes. So we have the ova, the larva, and the adult. So let's talk about the different forms of Ascaris lumbricoides ova or eggs. So there are three different forms. Let's talk about first the fertilized one. So the fertilized egg of Ascaris is the most common uh, form among the three, which has a three-layer 
uh, structure. So the inner is what we call the lipoidal vitellum membrane. The middle layer is what we call the transparent glycogen layer. And the outer is uh, cons con consists of coarsely mammillated albuminous layer, just like here on this picture. So we have the inner layer that surrounds the embryo, the middle one which is a transparent uh, glycogen membrane, and the outer layer which makes the egg look uh, thick. No? So this, uh, all of this uh, membrane protects the egg from different uh, stress, no? just like a physical stress from the, uh, in the soil, and of course the digestive um, action of our stomach. So now let's move on to unfertilized. So compared to your fertilized egg, unfertilized are longer and narrower, and some uh, may have okay, an oblong shape, just like here on this picture. So the only difference between unfertilized is that it has no middle layer or what we call the glycogen membrane. So normally, unfertilized egg usually are produced when female worms uh, don't have any male counterpart. And lastly, decorticated. This is typically or uh, may be fertilized or unfertilized, but the only difference, it, it lacks outer albuminous layer, just like here on this picture. So as you can see, compared to a normal fertilized egg, the uh, corticated, the decorticated egg do not have an outer mammillated albuminous layer. Hence, the outer layer of the egg appears to be transparent. So here is another description between the three forms for Ascaris lumbricoides ova. So for fertilized, it contains three layers, the outer coarsely mammillated albuminous layer or what we call the corticated, the inner a thick middle glycogen layer or chitin layer and the vitellin membrane which protects the unicellular embryo. For unfertilized, these are oblong in shape and it lacks the middle chitin layer. For decorticated, this is still fertilized but it lacks the outer albuminous layer. Another example for fertilized corticated, this is what it looks like. For fertilized decorticated, uh, it has a transparent shell due to the lack of albuminous coating. For unfertilized, these are uh, oblong in shape and narrower in terms of their shape and uh, size and shape. For unfertilized decorticated, this may appear as uh, oblong or rounded in shape with no particular middle membrane. So before we discuss the adult uh, worm for Ascaris lumbricoides, take note that larval forms of Ascaris are also present. But remember, the larval form are usually not seen or not passed down in the stool due to the fact that they develop as adults within the host itself. So normally, these are not seen by the, the by using diagnostic procedures, and also in terms of their morphology, this is these are relatively similar to the adult, but are smaller. So let's talk about the adult worm for Ascaris. So uh, the shape and color of these adult worms are elongated with cylindrical bodies that have tapered ends. Normally, their color is whitish to pinkish in color. And in terms of their cuticle or surface covering or the skin of the worm, it has a, vi a visible fine serrations and their mouth with triangular trilobate lips. So later on, we'll be discussing this. And in terms of the sexes, there are male and female counterpart with males which are relatively smaller in size than of the female counterpart. Usually, they range to 10 to, 10 to 31 centimeter in size with curved posterior ends, while females are 22 to 35 centimeters with straight pointed ends. So here is what we are talking about for their mouth or buccal cavity which has a triangular or trilobate lips. So as you can see in this picture, it has one, two, and three lips, which is very evident once we view it under the microscope or a face contrast microscope, which has a better magnification. So for the cuticle, it contains fine stereation just like here on this picture. So now let's talk about the life cycle of Ascaris lumbricoides. So the mode of transmission for this parasite is through the ingestion of their embryonated eggs, normally through fecal contamination in the soil. 
the habitat of the adult worms inhabit the small intestine. So don't forget the acronym CNASA, which represents the parasites that inhabit this particular area of the body. Infective stage of the parasite is embryonated egg. And the diagnostic stage where we can use this as extra uh, sources or extra references to further identify the species is through their adult worms, fertilized and unfertilized egg. Remember, in terms of the host requirement, humans are the only definitive host of this particular parasite. So this is strictly a human parasite with no intermediate host. So uh, in conclusion, in terms of the host requirement, humans are the intermediate and definitive host because we harbor the larva and also the uh, adult worm of the particular parasite. So here is a good um, acronym to remember the parasites that can be acquired via ingestion of embryonated eggs. So we have eight eggs. So A for Ascaris lumbricoides, T for Trichuris, and E for Enterobius. So all of these are acquired via ingestion. So here is the life cycle of Ascaris lumbricoides. So again, the life cycle starts off with the ingestion of the infective stage, your embryonated eggs. So when these eggs are ingested, they hatch in the lumen of the small intestine, releasing the larva. So the larva or the juvenile worms will then migrate to the cecum or proximal colon of our intestine where they will penetrate the intestinal wall, having access to the bloodstream of the host. So, with the use or with the help of our bloodstream, this larva will enter the venules of the liver through the portal vein, where upon uh, developing, they will again break out of the uh, blood vessels within our liver to go to the heart and pulmonary vessels. Usually, they break out of the capillaries surrounding our uh, air sacs or lungs, where they will undergo development or what we call the molting, M-O-L-T-I-N-G or development. So normally, upon reaching the lungs, this will travel to the larynx and oropharynx of the host where they will be swallowed again in the digestive tract. So they will go back to the particular area where they are firstly uh, released. So this larva or this particular pathway of migration causes the larva to develop within time. So upon reaching the small intestine, they will already become adults. So in the small intestine, the adults will copulate or reproduce, producing unembryonated eggs. So these unembryonated eggs will then be released in the stool as fertilized or unfertilized. Remember, unfertilized eggs will not uh, undergo further development due to the fact that it is not um, morphologically viable. So most of the time, these unfertilized eggs are produced when there is the absence of male worms. So fertilized egg, upon being released in the stool, will embryonate into L1 to L3 larva. So L1 represents the two-cell division of the egg, while the L2 represents the multiple divisions within the larva. So the embryonated egg contains the fully developed larva, just like here on this picture, and the cycle continues once the particular egg with the L3 larva is ingested by the suspected host. So now let's move on to the pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of Ascaris lumbricoides infection. So this is also known as Ascariasis, or in some textbook, this is called the sandbox infection due to the fact that uh, Ascaris is acquired through contaminated soil. Normally, your Ascariasis is divided into three categories. We have the pulmonary, intestinal, and extra-intestinal, which we'll be discussing one by one. So let's talk about the first two categories of ascariasis, mainly pulmonary. So the first pulmonary ascariasis is what we call ascaris pneumonitis. So from the suffix itis, which means inflammation, and pneumo, which means uh, lungs, this is basically the inflammation of our lungs. So this is due to the larval migration from the bloodstream going to the air sacs of our lungs, causing immune hypersensitivity. Normally, immune hypersensitivity is manifested because our body is trying to kill the parasite within the air sacs of our lungs, causing immune hypersensitivity or inflammation within the area. So, patient with Ascaris pneumonitis usually 
experiences initial symptoms of difficulty of breathing, fever because our body is trying to kill the parasite, and increased eosinophils in the blood. Severe uh, cases in terms of a severe infection, patient experiences dyspnea or difficulty of breathing, a dry product, uh, productive cough, and during x-ray, scattered infiltration or infiltrates are visible. And sometimes, occasional hemoptysis may also be present or what we call the bloody sputum. Next is low flare syndrome. This is associated with Ascaris pneumonitis, but the only difference is that they have, or patient with this particular syndrome, have increased or markedly increased eosinophils in their blood. So other uh, symptoms are very similar to Ascaris pneumonitis. So here is an x-ray of a patient who experiences pneumonia due to ascariasis. So as you can see on figure A, pneumonic infiltration are very evident at the upper lobe of the left lung. The appearance of the left lung on figure B is seen after the patient cuts off the worm. So occasionally, patient with pulmonary ascariasis may cuff up the worm from their lungs going to their sputum sample. So if you will view it under the microscope, the sputum sample will reveal multiple uh, eosinophils just like here on this picture and the presence of larval forms of ascaris. Charcot-laden crystals may also be present within the sputum sample. Next category is intestinal ascariasis. So under intestinal, Pot belly and ascaris bolus are associated. So this uh, particular ascariasis is due to the obstruction of adult worms in the intestine. So the most common complaint of patient with this particular disease is the vague abdominal pain. So that means the, uh, the pain uh, along the abdominal area is unknown. So moderate infection, especially for people with untreated ascariasis, uh, leads or predispose themselves to lactose intolerance and vitamin A malabsorption. Heavy infections usually is associated with ascaris bolus, interception, bowel infarction, and intestinal perforation. So when you say intestinal perforation, there is uh, usually no, um, ulcers or uh, sugat or wounds within our intestinal wall due to the constant biting or pricking of our uh, ascaris worms in our intestinal mucosa. So the last classification of ascariasis is what we call extraintestinal ascariasis. So this ascariasis is due to the erratic migration of adult worms from the intestine to other parts or organs of our body. Normally, people with this particular ascariasis is, uh, may predispose themselves to serious or fatal effects of the infection. So for worms, they may invade the bile ducts okay, of the liver causing biliary ascariasis. So this is basically the presence of the adult worm in the bile ducts of your liver. So this causes blockage within that area causing tissue hypoxia. So uh, may possible na uh, masira yung liver due to the lack of blood flow of the particular area. Uh, other organs may also be affected. So this may affect appendix causing acute appendicitis just like here on this picture or this also may affect other organs such as pancreas and peritoneal cavity. So for the laboratory diagnosis of Ascaris lumbricoides, the specimen of choice is usually stool samples. Sputum and duodenal aspirate may be occasionally required, especially in cases of extraintestinal ascariasis. For methods, the most commonly used one is the direct fecal smear. So I believe we already performed this in the laboratory. So this is basically the glass slide with a stool, a small amount of stool and one drop of NSS. Okay, cover it with co a cover slip and view it under the microscope under LPO to HPO. So here we will be identifying the presence of a fertilized corticated egg. For catocats and catothic, these are more sensitive uh, procedures. No? These are sensitive due to the fact that they use increased amount of stool samples. Okay? Normally, for catocats, it uses 60 to 70 milligrams of stool, while catothic uses 40 to 50 milligrams of stool. So, the increased amount of stool increases the yield of ascaris eggs in the stool sample. 
And lastly, for concentration techniques, these are used for lighter infection due to the fact that uh, this particular uh, procedure uses reagents that can separate fecal debris to, to your uh, parasites. Okay? So one example of this is your FECT or formalin ether ethyl acetate concentration technique. So for the treatment of ascariasis, we can use anti-helminthin drugs. Uh, example of this, we have albendazole, mebendazole, and pyrantel pamoate with albendazole as the drug of choice okay, for ascariasis. So these drugs are both benzimadole derivatives. So the mechanism of these derivatives usually block the uptake of glucose by most intestinal and tissue nematodes. So this causes the death of these particular adult worms. So for the prevention and control of most parasitic infections such as ascariasis, the DOH or Department of Health promotes the WASH framework which stands for water, sanitation, hygiene education, and deworming. So for the epidemiology, Ascaris lumbricoides has a cosmopolitan distribution. So when you say cosmopolitan, the cases are worldwide, but the cases occurs more in tropical regions of Southeast Asia, Africa, Central, and South America. Normally, the age group of this particular parasite affects children of 5 to 15 years of age. So they have the highest intensity of infection due to the lack of education of this uh, demographic. Worldwide, there is 1.2 billion individuals infected, with 70% comes from Asia. 2,000 uh, people die annually. And in terms of the uh, geographic distribution, this uh, focuses, no, yung kanyang cases, more focus on the uh, tropical countries due to the uh, increased humidity and as well as the uh, ample temperature that the Ascaris is more inclined to. So the next intestinal roundworm under Fasmid is Enterobius vermicularis. So Enterobius is also known as pinworm or sitworm and the old name of this parasite is Oxyuris vermicularis. So this is considered a nocturnal parasite because the female adult worm uh, usually lay their eggs on the perianal region of the patient during night time. So this is a causative agent of pruritus ani or what we call the perianal itching which is the main pathology behind this particular parasite. So for the ova of Enterobis vermicularis, these are considered asymmetrical. So that means one side of the egg is flattened and the other side is convex. So some sources describe this as the D-shaped egg. Normally in terms of the size, Ova of Enterobis vermicularis may range from 50 to 60 micrometers by 20 to 30 micrometers. The translucent shell consists of an outer triple albuminous layer or covering which uh, protects the embryo inside. So this is for mechanical protection against the external factors. It also contains an inner embryonic lipoidal membrane which is for chemical protection, especially inside the stomach. So inside the egg, this is a tadpole-like embryo that usually becomes uh, mature outside the host within 4 to 6 hours. So remember, if you are still familiar with our um, acronym uh, for ovoviviparous female worms, so these worms lay their egg with fully developed larva inside. So we have enterobius and strongyloides. So this can uh, eventually uh, hatch into a larva okay after four to six hours of being laid so again just like ascaris the larva of enterobis vermicularis are very similar to the adult except for the relatively small size so for adult they contain cuticular uh, alar expansions or what we call the cephalic allele so later on we'll be showing you in uh, detail what is this structure so for esophageal bulb this is the structure connected to the esophagus of your um, adult worm. Normally, this is very evident for Enterobis vermicularis, adult worm. For male, these are relatively smaller, which is consistent to all nematodes, with a curved tail and a single spicule for copulation or reproduction. For females, they may range to 18 to 13 millimeters with long pointed tail. 
For the larva, remember these are similar in morphology for the adults, but they have no cuticular expansion. So this may separate it from the other adult worms. So here is what we are talking about when we say the cephalic allele. So this is one of the characteristics of the adult worm for enterobius. So if you would notice a particular arrowhead-like appearance in their, usually in their anterior portion of the worm, this is definitely a enterobius vermicularis adult worm. For the life cycle of enterobius, the mode of transmission is through ingestion of embryonated egg, which is the infective stage of the parasite. This is also known as the fecal-oral route. The enterobius vermicularis can also be acquired through the respiratory system via inhalation. So this is uh, where the host accidentally inhaled dust containing enterobius eggs. And also, uh, this can be acquired through the anus by retroinfection, wherein the hatch larva enter the anus and causes retroinfection when they go back into the large intestine. So the risk factors for acquiring this parasite includes overcrowding where there is imminent uh, sharing of beds and clothes, uh, thumb sucking for children, nail biting, and lack of parental knowledge on the parasite. So. The habitat of the parasite, especially the adult worms, includes the large intestine. So this is a part of our mnemonics ET for enterobius and trichuris. The infective stage of the parasite is embryonated egg. And the diagnostic stage is eggs on perianal folds. Normally, the eggs cannot pass down or are not passed down in the stool, but rather the eggs are located in the anal region of the patient. In terms of the requirement host, requirement of the host, humans are the only definitive and intermediate host. So we harbor the larva and the adult forms of the parasite. So for the life cycle of Enterobis vermicularis, your female and male adult worms are usually found at the cecum and adjacent portion of the small and large intestine but mainly in the large intestine. So upon reproducing, the female worm will migrate from the large intestine down to the anus of the infected person to lay their egg. Usually, adult female worms lay their egg during nighttime where there is less activity of the patient. So a single enterobius vermicularis worm may lay up to 4,000 to 16,000 eggs per day. Usually, after egg deposition, the female worm will die in the process. So, eggs on the anal region of the patient will mature within 4 to 6 hours. So, these uh, eggs, okay, uh, through ingestion, inhalation, or retroinfection, may infect another, uh, may infect the same patient. So, these eggs on perianal fold, uh, folds are accidentally ingested by the same patient, okay, uh, due to uh, risk factors such as unsanitary practices. So the cycle continues once the embryonated egg is ingested by the host. So in terms of pathogenesis for Enterobis vermicularis, this is generally called enterobiasis. And one of the associated disease is what we call pruritus ani, and it is characterized by intense perianal itching. So usually this is due to the migration of the female worm to the anal region to produce eggs. These uh, eggs, just like here on this picture, and the presence of the adult worm causes irritation within that area. So intense itching may lead to scratching by the patient and predisposing themselves to secondary bacterial infection. Usually, the most commonly affected age group are children and may experience other symptoms that includes insomnia, restlessness, poor appetite, weight loss, irritability, grinding of teeth, and abdominal pain. So this parasitic disease is extremely contagious. That's why it has multiple modes of transmission and can easily spread among members of the family or institution, hence the classification familial disease. That's why it's very important that we not only treat the infected person, but also treat other family members that are exposed with the infected one. Auto-infection is also possible due to the nature of the eggs of enterobius. So these eggs uh, will eventually hatch within the anal region 
okay turning into uh, turning into a larva this larva will migrate to the anal region to the large intestine repeating the cycle in terms of the extraintestinal enterobiasis these are very similar to ascaris so usually uh, the erratic migration of adult worms to other parts of the body or organs of the body causes inflammation within that area so they may uh, also produce appendicitis or the inflammation within the appendix and vaginitis or inflammation within the vaginal canal so just a nice to know here are the parasites that causes auto infection so don't forget cool chest so cool chest uh, represents capillarizes Christo, uh, cryptosporidium, which is a protozoan, Hymenolepis nana, which is a tapeworm, Enterobius, Strongyloides, and Tania, which is also a tapeworm. For the lab diagnosis, the specimen of choice is eggs on perianal region. So this is acquired through the Graham scotch tape swab. So later on, we'll discuss this method. But uh, in terms of the stool, this may only yield 5% okay uh, eggs since these particular parasite are not passed down in the stool but rather deposited especially their eggs on the anal region of the patient in terms of direct fecal smear this is helpful if stool sample is received but the most uh, commonly used or uh, required for this identification of the parasite is through the graham scotch tape swap so this is the method for Graham scotch tape swab. So this is the best method to acquire eggs on the perianal region of the infected host or patient. Usually this is done early in the morning before defecation and baiting of the patient. So this is done by uh, using a clear plastic uh, tape that is pulled back over the end of the slide to expose the gum surface. Normally the gum surface is the sticky area or part of the scotch tape. The slide with the scotch tape is attached to a tongue depressor for uh, stability. So we open the, uh, the tape and expose the sticky part okay, of the tape. We then uh, attach or press the sticky, uh, sticky part of the tape in the anal region of the patient so that we can acquire these types of microscopic eggs. And then we just replace the tape on the slide or place the tape on the slide just like a cover slip and view it under the microscope. So this is what uh, Enterobius vermicularis eggs look like under the microscope using your Graham scotch tape method. So as you can see, the D-shaped eggs are very evident and when zoomed out, as you can see, the flattened area and the convex area are very uh, evident or visible. Treatment and prevention for enterobius infection is similar to Ascaris. So we can use antihelmintic drugs of mebendazole, albendazole, and pyrantel pamuid as a treatment for this particular parasite. So prevention is through personal cleanliness and personal hygiene, uh, especially among uh, family members, and as well as following the WASH framework by DOH. For the pathology of Enterobis vermicularis, this occurs in both temperate and tropical regions of the world. Example of this is Philippines. So this is also the only intestinal nematode infection that cannot be controlled through sanitary disposal of human feces. This is due to the nature of the deposition of their eggs. Usually, unlike other nematodes, for Enterobius, the eggs are deposited not in the stool but in the, stool, uh, in the anal region of the patient. So worldwide, there is approximately 208 million cases of infected persons. Locally, here in the Philippines, the prevalence rate is higher in female school children than of male counterparts. Usually, these are uh, found, or especially the eggs, are found in nail clippings of school children. So, the next intestinal roundworms that we will be discussing are the hookworms. Hookworms that infect humans include Nectar americanus and Ancelostoma duodenale. For Nectar americanus, this is also known as the New World hookworm and the American murderer. This is so called New World hookworm because the cases were prevalent in the tropical Africa and the Americas. While for Ancelostoma duodenale, the other name is the Old World hookworm and germ of laziness. It is so-called Old World because cases were prevalent in Europe and Southwestern Asia. 
Both of these are considered SDH or soil transmitted helminths together with Ascaris and Strongyloides. So these are also known as the blood sucking nematodes, giving the patient, especially at chronic stages, iron deficiency anemia. So for the ova morphology of hookworms, regardless of necator or ancelostoma, these are all same for all species. So these are quite indistinguishable and we cannot differentiate this um, species based on solely their eggs. They have bluntly rounded ed, uh, ends and have a single thin transparent hyaline shell. So inside the shell, we have the morula ball, which are or contain 2 to 8 cell stages. So these are the um, uh, developing embryo. So the higher the cell stage, the mature the egg is. So for the larval forms of hookworms, we have two. And this is your rhabditiform larva and the filariform larva. So just like the ova of hookworms, the lar their larva cannot be uh, differentiated no? in terms of species. So this is difficult to differentiate. And let's talk about their uh, description. For rhabditiform larva, this is usually present in the soil where this is under the feeding stage of the parasite. So here, it has a long oral cavity to facilitate eating or feeding. But uh, remember, the difference is that it has a small genital primordium due to the fact that this is not a sexual stage of the parasite. So here is a sample picture of the rhabditiform larva of hookworms. So remember the presence of a large or long esophagus and a pointy end or tail. So compared to rhabditiform larva, your filariform larva or L3 is the non-feeding and infective stage of the parasite. So since this is the non-feeding stage, it has a shorter esophagus than of the rhabditiform larva but with a pointed tail. So here is an example of a filariform larva. So among all the morphological stage of hookworms, the adult morphology is the best way to differentiate the species under hookworms. So for Necator americanus and Ancelostoma, in, in terms of their appearance, these are small, cylindrical, fusiform, when we say fusiform, elongated, tapered at both ends, grayish-white nematodes. So both of these are similar in appearance, but in terms of the size, Ancelostoma duodenale adults are slar slightly larger. While for the head or the anterior portion of the worm, Necator americanus are curved, just like here on this picture, or what we call the hook-like appearance. While for Ancelostoma, this, uh, their head continues in the same direction as their curvature of the body. For the buccal capsule, this is the pathognomic uh, characteristic. So when we say pathognomic, so this is the best diagnostic tool where we can differentiate the two adult worms. So the presence of their um, buccal capsule with uh, cutting plates or ventral teeth. So for Necator americanus, take note that it contains a ventral pair of semilunar cutting plates. So later on, we'll discuss this and show you a picture of this particular anatomy or structure. Well, for Ancelostoma duodenale, don't forget that their buccal capsule has two pairs of curved ventral teeth. So, para uh, hindi makalimutan, for Necator americanus, Necator, Necating plates americanus. Well, for Ancelostoma duodenale, that is teeth. So, here is the difference of uh, hookworm adults based on their buccal cavity or capsule. So for Necator americanus, it contains a one median tooth with pair of semilunar cutting plates, just like here on this picture. While for Ancelostoma duodenale, it contains two ventral pairs of fused teeth. For Ancelostoma caninum and Brasiliense, these are zoonotic nematodes or specifically zoonotic hookworms. So in the future, we will be discussing this under the last topic for nematodes. So here is a more realistic uh, picture of the buccal capsule of both hookworms. So for Ancelostoma duodenale, it has pairs of ventral teeth, just like here on this picture. While for uh, Necator americanus, contains cutting plates.
So, although rarely uh, used, adult male hookworms can also be differentiated based on their appearance of their copulatory bursa. Just like we have discussed a while ago, copulat copulatory bursa are used by your male worms to attach themselves to the female during copulation or sexual reproduction. So, this uh, usually contains uh, spicules or barbs that, atta that can attach to the vulva or vagina of the particular female worm. So, for the male copulatory bursa of N. americanus or Necator americanus, this is so-called bipartite. Bipartite, which means that the spicules are fused and barbed. Later on, we'll be uh, showing you a picture or a side-by-side -side comparison of their uh, barbed spicules. While for Ancylostoma duodenale, this is so-called tripartite because the spicules are unfused and not barbed. So here is a better version of their copulatory bursa between Necator americanus and Ancelostoma duodenale, male adult worms. So as you can see, for Necator americanus, their spicules are fused together, while for Ancelostoma, unfused. So for the life cycle of hookworms, the mode of transmission is through skin penetration by the infective stage filariform larva. Although the most common MOT of hookworms is skin penetration, for Ancelostoma duodenale, it can be both skin penetration and through oral route. In the oral route of uh, the infection, these particular parasites are acquired via ingestion of raw infected vegetables and meat. For the habitat, both hookworms uh, inhabit, especially their adult forms, inhabit the small intestine. While the infective stage is the L3 larva or the filariform larva in specific. Diagnostic stage are eggs. Uh, only at uh, identifying if it's a hookworm or other um, skin penetrating uh, organism but in terms of the species identification or differentiation we can use the adults just like the other soil transmitted helminths humans are the only definitive host with this particular parasite so the hookworm life cycle is very direct and begins with the adult worms copulating while attached to the mucosa of the small intestine the female worms will lay their egg into the intestinal lumen and the eggs are passed out with human feces. So if the feces is in contact with the soil, this is where the development of the egg begins. So in the soil, the embryo within the egg develops rapidly and hatches 1 to 2 days into the rhabdidiform larva. So the rhabdidiform larva is again the feeding stage of the parasite. So here, after 7 to 10 days, the larva undergoes two stages of molting or development and transform into a non-feeding filariform larva, which is called the L3 larva or filariform. So this is the infective stage of the parasite. So the filariform larva penetrate the skin and enter the venules of the particular uh, suspected host. No? So this will um, eventually... Uh, lead their way to the bloodstream of the patient. So just like your Ascaris and Strongyloides, hookworms migrate to the heart and lungs and then to the alveoli, causing a heart-to-lung migration. So the larva then ascend to the trachea and oropharynx and are finally swallowed by the particular host due to irritation. So these particular uh, larva are passed down to the small intestine where the worms become sexually mature and the female will start laying eggs, uh, repeating the cycle. So pathogenesis and clinical manifestation of hookworms involve three categories. So we have the skin as the site of entry of filariform larva, the lungs during larval migration, and the small intestine where the habitat of the adult worms is present. So let's talk about first the entry site. So the skin usually at the lower limbs or extremities of the patient is involved where the filariform entered. So penetration of the filariform larva through the skin produces maculopopular lesions and localized erythema, just like here on this picture. So usually these um, uh, lesions are itchy and um, most often are very severe in uh, effect. So these are also known as dew itch or ground itch. 
as it is related to contact with soil, especially on a dewy morning. So, itching, edema, and erythema, and later papilovesicular eruptions where there is pus within the lesions are evident and can last for 2 weeks. Next category is through the larval forms in the lungs. So usually, this is what we call pulmonary hookworm infection. And if the larval migrating through the lungs are abundant, bronchitis or the inflammation of your bronchioles or bronchi and pneumonitis may result. In the course of the migration, this, uh, the larva produces minute hemorrhages within the uh, lungs together with eosinophils and leukocytic infiltration. So, the symptoms is very similar to Ascaris Loeffler syndrome. So, this is characterized by marked eosinophilia with the inflammation of your lungs. It can, it can also uh, produce mild respiratory symptoms such as coughing okay, and difficulty in breathing. And also, just like Ascaris, there is the presence of transient migratory pulmonary infiltrates. If you still remember our x-ray uh, picture a while ago for Ascaris. Uh, there are no specific reason as to why the cases are very rare in the tropics, just like here in the Philippines. So the last category is intestinal hookworm infection. So in the stage of maturation of the worm in the intestine, there is present abdominal pain, steatorrhea, or the presence of lipids or oil in the stool, diarrhea with blood and mucus is also evident, and increased eosinophils in the blood. Steatorrhea and diarrhea with blood and mucus are due to the constant biting or attaching of hookworms in the intestinal lining of our small intestine. So this causes small uh, lacerations within the lining of our intestine, leaking blood per day. So due to the blood loss, patients at chronic stages may predispose themselves into iron deficiency anemia and hypoalbuminemia. So this is a condition, hypoalbuminemia, a condition where there is low albumin in the blood. So in severe cases, people with uh, chronic stages of intestinal hookworm infection may experience dyspnea or difficulty in breathing, weakness, dizziness, and lassitude. So for the laboratory diagnosis of hookworm infection, the specimen of choice is stool samples. Sputum may, be, may also be used in cases of uh, pulmonary involvement, while for duodenal aspirate, this is useful when stool samples provide inaccurate results. For the methods, we can use the traditional way of direct fecal smear, but this is only of value when the infection is quite heavy. For lighter infection, this is not recommended. While for catocats and catotic, these methods may increase the detection rates since more stools are examined using these types of technique. Especially for catocats, this may also provide quantitative diagnosis by determining the intensity of infection uh, in terms of the number of helminth eggs per gram of feces. So next is concentration techniques. So example of this, we have the zinc uh, sulfate uh, centrifugal filtration or the formalin ether ethyl acetate concentration. So either of the two can be used to uh, decrease the or to separate the fecal debris to the particular parasite eggs or worms. We can also use the Harada Mori culture technique but this is more on the research purposes only. So later on we'll show you the procedure behind this particular uh, technique. So, I believe you have already uh, performed this uh, technique, your catothic and catocats. So, the only difference between a catocats, uh, the catocats is that we use a template okay, in measuring the uh, stool sample. Uh, before we uh, put the stool sample in the template, we also filtered using a wire mesh or a cloth mesh okay, and transferring this uh, filtered stool sample in the template. So, the rest of the procedure is similar to uh, catotic. So, this is the Harada Mori culture technique. So, this is more helpful in uh, viewing or observing the larval forms of our hookworms. So, this is done by using a glass test tube with water at the bottom and putting a filtered paper 
with smear of feces at the bottom of the paper. So the principle behind the technique is that if the smeared feces contains hookworm eggs, these eggs will uh, hatch upon appropriate temperature. So these eggs will hatch into reptitiform larva and will transfer to the water okay, after some time. So this particular water is extracted and viewed under the microscope using a glass slide. For the treatment, we can use antihelmintic drugs of albendazole, mebendazole, and parental palm weight. So similar to ascaris and astrongloides. So for the prevention and control, we can use the WASH framework. And under Hygiene Education, Section E, we can uh, inform, especially uh, the public, to use proper footwear to prevent the spread of hookworm infection. So for the epidemiology, geographical distribution is under tropical and subtropical countries. Normally for the age group, farmers are more susceptible since their work area is also the best uh, environment for hookworms to thrive. So this is damp sandy or friable soil with decaying vegetation and usually the temperature should be at the ranges of 24 to 32 degrees celsius paramilitary personnel also uh, predisposed to these uh, types of parasite due to their line of work indigenous and school children especially children with uh, no footwear protection are predisposed to these parasites there are 576 to 700 uh, 40 million people infected worldwide with 50,000 deaths due to anemia or iron deficiency anemia. So the next intestinal roundworm is Trongyloides tercoralis. So this is also known as the trend worm and it is the smallest intestinal nematode of humans. So adults of this parasite may range from 1 to 2 millimeters by 0 0.4 millimeters in size. So this is considered to be also a soil transmitted health meat together with ascaris and hookworms. So if you still remember our discussion in the introduction, Strongyloides is also a facultative nematode which means that it contains a parasitic and a free living forms. For parasitic, female are the only uh, significant morphology or uh, forms which resides in the small intestine, while the free-living male and female are found in the soil. In terms of the ova of Strongyloides tercoralis, this is very similar to the hookworm eggs. So they contain clear thin shells surrounding the embryo, and usually, uh, in terms of the size, these are relatively smaller than of the hookworms. So around 50 to 58 micrometers by 30 to 34 micrometers. So other sources describe this as the Chinese lantern ova due to the uh, similarities but also this is so-called Chinese because the pathology is what we call the Cochin China diarrhea which we'll be discussing later on. So for the free living larva, your Strongylodes tercoralis also contains two morphological forms. So we have the rhabditiform and the filariform larva. So let's differentiate your Strongyloides tercoralis larva to the hookworms since these are also similar. So for Strongyloides uh, tercoralis rhabditiform, it has a shorter buccal cavity and a large genital primordium. Again, for genital primordium, this is the initial uh, structure where testes and ovary develops. Well, for filariform larva, it has a longer esophagus compared to hookworms and has a diagnostic notch or fork tail, just like here on this picture. So, parang there is a cleft or invagination between the tail. So, for parasitic filariform female larva, usually are described separately. So, this differs from the free-living larva in, time, uh, in terms of size and appearance. So usually they measure at around 2 millimeters, so slightly larger, by 0 0.4 millimeters. So these are colorless, semi-transparent with finely striated cuticle or skin. So in terms of their anterior portion, it has a slender tapering anterior end, which is usually um, very common to hookworms and strongyloides. For the buccal cavity, it contains a short with four indistinct lips. 
for the posterior, so this is the best differentiation between parasitic and free-living larval forms. So for parasitic, instead of a conical notch fork tail, o yung parang pa clef na tail, for uh, parasitic filariform female, it has a pointy conical uh, tail. So, here are the differences between the free-living male and female adult worms. So, normally, these are not clinically significant since these are free-living in nature. So, they do not cause any disease to humans and also are not found inside the host. So, usually, they are found in soil. So, here are all the characteristics or differentiation of a free-living uh, female worm and free-living male worm. So, kindly take note na lang. So, for the life cycle, the mode of transmission of strongyloides is through skin penetration of the infective stage filariform larva. So, very similar to hookworm mode of transmission. So, for the habitat, this resides in the small intestine and the infective stage is filariform larva. Well, for the diagnostic stage where we can use to identify the parasite is eggs and rhabdidiform larva. For the host, humans and dogs are susceptible or as okay, uh, act as definitive host for this parasite. There are no intermediate hosts, so that means humans and dogs harbor the larval and adult forms of this parasite. So for the complex life cycle of Strongyloides tercoralis, this involves three types of cycles. So we have the free living cycle which involves the free living adult male and female worm. For parasitic cycle this involves the female parasitic filariform larva and for the auto infection cycle this involves the development of rhabditiform larva to filariform inside the human host. So let's talk about first the free living cycle. In the free living cycle this starts when rhabditiform larva hatches in the small intestine and pass down in the stool of an infected host. So there are two ways where your rhabditiform larva may develop in the soil. If the soil provides no nutrients and, har and have harsh condition uh, for the parasite, the rhabditiform larva will directly develop into filariform larva to protect their species. So this particular uh, parasite will have to develop into an infected form so that they can enter a host, usually humans or dogs. If the uh, conditions are met, the rhabditiform larva will instead develop into free-living adult male and female worms. So in the soil, this produces eggs which develops into rhabditiform larva again. So again, if the uh, conditions are again not met so there is harsh conditions and the rhabditiform larva cannot uh, feed any uh, nutrients from the soil this rhabditiform larva will again turn into filariform larva when needed so this filariform larva will penetrate the skin of the host and enter the bloodstream and this is where parasitic life cycle continues so in the parasitic life cycle your female filariform larva will migrate from the bloodstream to the lymphatics and to the lungs where they will reach until the trachea and oropharynx where it will cause irritation within that area, coughing or swallowing up uh, eventually by the host which uh, leads them going back to the small intestine. So in the small intestine, the larva will uh, develop twice and become adult female worms. So these adult female are capable of parthenogenesis. So that means they can uh, produce eggs even without the presence of male counterparts. So eventually, these eggs produced in the small intestine will develop inside the small intestine and develop into rhabditiform larva. So they, uh, there are possible cases that rhabditiform larva will directly develop into filariform causing auto-infection or some of it will uh, pass down in the stool repeating the cycle. So just like hookworms, there are three phases of acute infection in strongyloides infection. This is also known as strongyloidiasis. So this involves the invasion of the skin by filariform larva. 
the migration of the larva through the body, specifically in the lungs, and the penetration of the intestinal mucosa by adult female worms. So for the entry site or the invasion of the skin by filariform larva, this uh, involves the signs and symptoms of erythema, pruritic elevated hemorrhagic papules, just like here on this picture. So for the pulmonary strangulodiasis, this is due to the larval migration of the female uh, parasitic worm causing destruction and systemic hypersensitivity in our lungs. So this involves one or two of the lobes of the lung causing lower pneumonia with bleeding or hemorrhage. So this uh, involves symptoms of blood in the lungs, cough, and tracheal irritation. So just like Ascaris and hookworms, this manifests Loeffler's syndrome. So these are manifested by marked eosinophilia and inflammation within the lungs uh, with mild respiratory synto uh, symptoms and transient migratory pulmonary infiltrates. So in the third phase or intestinal phase, adult female worms may be found in the intestinal mucosa from the pylorus to the rectum, but the greatest numbers are usually found in the duodenal and upper jejunal regions of our intestines. Light infection does not cause intestinal symptoms, but moderate usually causes diarrhea with alternating constipation. So that means after a patient okay, uh, defecated, there will be periods of time where the patient will feel constipated. So in terms of heavy infection, this produces intractable, painless, intermittent diarrhea. So when you say intermittent, so there are uh, several hours or uh, intervals where diarrhea is experienced by the patient. So like for example, at 8 a.m., the patient defecated with diarrhea stool and after uh, two hours, the patient will again experience that diarrhea, so intermittent. So this is also known as the Cochin China diarrhea because the first case was uh, recorded in China. So these are uh, episodes of watery and bloody stools. In rare cases, immunocompromised patient may develop hyperinfection. So this is considered as the accelerated autoinfection where it manifests as the exacerbation of gastrointestinal and pulmonary manifestations. So, uh, come to think of uh, having uh, both uh, infections at once but with greater severity. So, since nga, uh, immunocompromised patients have lower um, immune state, so they cannot fight off these particular parasites, okay, increasing the auto-infection rate of such parasites. So it manifests with um, increased numbers of larvae in the stool and sputum. So usually, uh, these immunocompromised patients involves people living with AIDS, people with cancer, people who under uh, who are malnourished, and also those using immunosuppressive drugs after organ transplantation. For the laboratory diagnosis, the specimen of choice for Strongyloides tercoralis is stool. So sputum can be used as well if the patient experiences pulmonary strongyloidiasis. Urine can also be acquired if there is involvement of the urinary tract and duodenal aspirate can be acquired using the Bale string test which we uh, we will discuss later on if stool samples are not uh, are produced okay or produce inaccurate results. For the methods, we can use the conventional direct fecal smear for the identification of the parasites, especially their eggs. We can also use concentration techniques such as the Beerman funnel ga uh, gauze method and also the modified Harada Mori culture technique. So we can also use nutrient agar plate technique and serological testing using serum to detect the antibodies produced by our body against the parasite. So this falls under immunology already. So for the modified Harada Mori culture technique, this is a practical and low cost that is suitable for mass screening and as well as individual diagnosis. Normally, this is only different from uh, the Harada Mori culture technique where instead of a glass tube, we use a uh, polyethylene plastic bags or tubes. So this uh, is more appropriate since plastic bags and tubes are unbreakable and are lighter to transport. 
So in this picture is what we call the Bill String Test. So this is uh, usually done to acquire duodenal aspirate in the patient. So normally, this is a string with a gel capsule attached to it. So this gel capsule is ingested by the patient to absorb the duodenal aspirate. So the end of the string is attached or taped in the cheek of the patient to provide stability. So after a few minutes or hours, the physician will pull up the string to extract the gel capsule. So the duodenal aspirate absorbed in the gel capsule will be used for further testing. So here is the Beerman funnel setup which is considered to be a concentration technique to acquire or extract nematodes which are specifically from soil sample or plant materials. Normally, this van, uh, uh, Beerman funnel setup involves the funnel with a filter uh, bag or filter paper on top of it, a soil sample, a clamp that holds the funnel in place, a rubber tubing where the filtered water flows through, a clamp where we can uh, increase or decrease the uh, flow of water to the beaker. So the, spe uh, the specific gravity of a nematode, specifically stromuloides, is higher than water. So that means upon uh, being filtered, the nematodes will travel down or sink to the bottom of the glass tubing going to the beaker. So only the plant materials and other soil uh, uh, deposits will remain in the bag while the lower, uh, the higher specific gravity organisms such as nematodes will sink to the bottom of the funnel. So for the treatment and prevention, we can use antihelminthic drugs to treat these par parasitic infections, strangulodiasis. So we can use albendazole, thiabendazole, and ivermectin as the drug of choice. So for the prevention and control, we can uh, include the WASH framework, especially the hygiene education under Section E, the proper use of uh, footwear. So for the epidemiology of Strongyloides tercoralis, this has a cosmopolitan or worldwide distribution, but the cases are more concentrated in countries of tropics and subtropical, uh, some countries in Europe as well, and USA. There are 50 to 100 million people affected, while here in the Philippines, Strongyloides uh, cases are rare. Each group, uh, so male children of 7 to 14 years old, are more predisposed to this type of parasites. The uh, factors that affect transmission of this parasite is through uh, poor sanitation. This is also due to indis indiscriminate disposal of human feces and also auto-infection. So we're finally done with the subclass Cernentia or Fasnid intestinal roundworms. Now let's move on to the subclass Adenophorea or what we call the Apasnids. So again, going back to our discussion, Apasnids lack the posterior caudal chemoreceptors. So here in the subclass, we have Trichuris trichura, which inhabits the large intestine, while Capillaria philippinensis inhabits the tissues and the small intestine. So without further ado, let's start with the first Apasnid. So that would be Trichuris trichura. So this is also known as Trichocephalus trichurius, or more commonly known as the whipworm. They are so-called whipworm because the adults of this particular parasite appear to be whip. So they have a narrow anterior portion going to a more broader tail region. So these are these parasites are considered to be apasnid, so that means they don't have any chemo, uh, caudal chemoreceptor in their posterior area or tail area. So, like Ascaris, hookworm, and Strongyloides, these are soil transmitted helminths. So, these are also the worms that secrete a TT47. This is a pore forming lutein that allows them to embed their entire whip like portion into the intestinal wall. So this helps them attach to the intestinal wall more securely. So now let's talk about the ova of Trichuris trichura. So the approximate measurements of the egg are usually around 50 to 54 micrometers in length 
by 23, uh, 23 micrometers in size or in uh, thickness. So it is a lemon shape, barrel shape, or a football shape with bipolar hyaline plugs. Usually, this uh, egg has a yellowish outer and a transparent inner shell protecting the unicellular embryo. So uh, uh, usually fertilized eggs are unsegmented. So that means these are underdeveloped uh, when laid by the female worm okay, and released in the stool. And um, embryonic development uh, should take place in soil, no? specifically clayish soil. So compared with Ascaris egg, Trichuris eggs are more susceptible to desiccation in the soil. So some sources uh, describe this as well as the Japanese lo uh, lantern ova, okay, connoting the similarities in shape. So again, uh, yellowish to uh, yellowish outer and transparent inner shell with a with a lemon or barrel shape having two bipolar hyaline plugs. In terms of the larva, larva are not usually described probably because soon after the embryonic uh, eggs are ingested, the larva escape and penetrate the intestinal wall where they remain for 3 to 10 days before uh, maturing into adults. Here is a good example of a trichuris egg under the microscope. So take note of the bipolar plugs, the lemon shape, and also the transparent uh, inner shell with a yellowish outer shell. So take note also that in the picture, we have what we call the Entamoeba coli cyst. So this is a protozoan and usually protozoans are transparent under the microscope. That's why it's very important to use different stains to highlight their structure. But if you can st uh, notice, so this protozoan contains multiple nucleus inside. Occasionally, uh, adult worm examination may be possible, especially at higher cases of infection. But again, the agnostic stage of the parasite is still the ova. But let's talk about the uh, appearance of adult worm under the microscope. So these are usually for males, these are shorter, so are at around 30 to 45 millimeters compared to the female one. So look at the um, posterior end of a particular worm. So usually male adult trichuris worm have a coiled posterior with a single spicule, uh, spicule and retractile shape, just like here on this picture. So figure A is a male uh, trichuris worm. So for the female, these are longer in uh, size and in length at around 35 to 50 but they have a blunt posterior end. So remember, both uh, adult worms are attenuated. So patusok yung kanilang anterior area. Okay, traversed by a narrow esophagus uh, that resembles a string of beads. So in their posterior or tail area, it becomes robust or uh, narrow, i uh, sorry, or broad, okay, from a a narrow esophagus to a more broader uh, broader um, posterior end. So here is an adult trichuris trichura that was removed during colonoscopy. So can you guess, is it a male or female adult trichuris? So this is a male trichuris, no? Adult trichuris. So note the posterior uh, uh, end of the parasite. So it's a coiled posterior. Most of the time, this is a male trichuris trichura. So on figure A, as you can see, this is the anterior portion of the worm. So the worm for trichuris uh, adults have a narrow esophagus. No? While for the figure B, this is the retractile sheep that we are talking about that covers the spicule for male adult trichuris worm. So this is uh, the posterior end of the worm or the tail. So for the life cycle of trichuris, the mode of transmission is through ingestion of embryonated egg. So the habitat is the large intestine, especially their adults, and the infective stage is embryonated eggs. So don't forget the mnemonic 8. So these are acquired via ingestion of 
embryonated eggs. So Ascaris, Trichuris, and Enterobius. So the agnostic stage of these parasites are unembryonated eggs which are patch, uh, passed down in the stool or sometimes you can also use the adults. Humans are the definitive host and there are no intermediate hosts present in the life cycle. So here is a simple life cycle of Trichuris trichura. So Trichuris worms inhabit the cecum and the colon of our large intestine. Here in this picture. So usually, the worms secrete a pore forming protein called the TT47 that allows them to embed their entire whip-like portion into the intestinal wall of, uh, of their host. After copulation, the female worms will lay their eggs which are passed out with the feces and deposited in the soil. So the unembryonated eggs which are deposited in the soil will, um, under favorable conditions, will develop and become embryonated within 2 to 3 weeks. So normally, this will undergo L1, L2, sorry, L1, L2 or the advanced cleavage stage and the L3 which contains the fully developed larva. Okay, so that means this is already infective or embryonated. So if this particular embryonated egg are swallowed, the, inf uh, the infective eggs will go to the small intestine and undergo four larval stages to become adults. So the process, so one of the unique uh, process for the life cycle of Trichuris is that they do not perform heart to lung migration. So within the small intestine, the larva will hatch and will travel to your large intestine to fully mature as adults. So according to references, each female uh, trichuris worm can produce about 60 million eggs over an average lifespan of 2 years. So now let's talk about the pathogenesis and clinical manifestation of trichuris trichura. So this is also known as trichuriasis and it only involves intestinal uh, relation. So for intestinal trichuriasis, this is due to the anterior portion of the adult worms which are embedded in the mucosa of our intestine. So this causes minute uh, ulcerations or what we call the petechial hemorrhages. This is due to the constant uh, attaching of the uh, whip-like portion of the uh, worms okay, in our intestine. So usually, this um, ulceration or petechial hemorrhages in specific uh, gives a better environment to entamoeba histolytica. So people uh, who have lighter infections of trichuriasis can uh, be infected with another parasite which is your entamoeba histolytica. So by the way, it causes amoebic dysentery. So this is a bloody diarrhea caused by entamoeba. So usually this is acquired through contaminated uh, food and water. So in cases of people with uh, intestinal trichuriasis, they may develop uh, with hyperemic and edematous mucosa or their intestinal lining. Usually when we say hyperemic, this is the excessive uh, transport of blood from a certain tissue or organ. For edematous, since there is inflammation within the area, the particular organ, especially the mucosa, is uh, inflamed. And the enter enterohagia is also common so this is bleeding within the intestine. So now let's move on to the um, heavy infections of intestinal trichuriasis. So the intensity of infection is usually important in understanding the clinical picture. Normally, infections with more than 5,000 eggs per gram of stool or feces is considered to be symptomatic. So patient may uh, experience... No? Um, trichuris dysentery syndrome. This is uh, this happens when patients with heavy uh, intensity infection have worms that may be found throughout the colon and rectum. So this is characterized by chronic dysentery or what we call the bloody diarrhea and rectal prolapse, just like here on this picture. So such cases of heavy chronic trichuriasis are often abdominal. Uh, are open, uh, accompanied by abdominal pain, uh, blood streak diarrheic stool, tenderness of the colon, especially in their abdominal cavity, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. 
uh, anemia is strongly correlated to heavy intensity infection of trichoriasis. Usually, according to the book, the blood loss of people with heavy trichoriasis may range from 0.8 to 8.6 ml per day. So, uh, furthermore, in children, uh, as low as 800 worms can result already in anemia. On the other hand, uh, in terms of the light uh, infections, usually anemia is associated but are, are generally um, treated. Okay, um, The prognosis of this disease is good because there is no larval migration. So, uh, compared to ascaris and hookworm, na undergo uh, larval migration which can affect the lungs and the heart, your trichuris can uh, do not okay, uh, follow this life cycle. So, only intestinal and anemia can be um, correlated in terms of their pathology. So, here is a sample picture of a normal rectum uh, against a prolapsed rectum. So, people with heavy infections of trichoriasis can experience frequent painful uh, uh, bowel movements that contain a mixture of mucus, water, and blood. Normally, rectal prolapse this is when the rectum sags and comes out of the anus. So usually, this is more common to children with heavy infections that can be severely anemic and may grow more slowly as the uh, progression of the uh, disease okay, uh, intensifies. So for the laboratory diagnosis of trichoriasis, clinical diagnosis may be possible only in very a heavy chronic trichoriasis. So here, even without the laboratory diagnosis, we can uh, diagnose a specific patient based on their clinical signs and symptoms. So patient who suffers from frequent blood streak diarrhea, abdominal pain, tenderness, and of course the rectal prolapse where adult worms are attached, okay, may be uh, signs and symptoms that can help us diagnose a patient clinically but uh, in lighter infections where these types of signs and symptoms are not visible we can use the laboratory diagnosis so for the specimen of choice this is tool since uh, the main pathology of our parasite is through intestinal route for the methods we can use the conventional methods such as the direct fecal smear to visualize the uh, eggs of this particular parasite your trichuris trichura Cats and catotic uh, uses a substantial amount of stool, so these are better in uh, increasing the chances of acquiring the specific eggs or ova of our parasites. We can also concentrate or use concentration techniques such as your FECT or what we call the formalin ethyl acetate concentration. So this separates the, um, the fecal debris okay, to the um, parasite themselves. So we use this. Uh, reagents okay with specific uh, variated or variations of specific gravity for the treatment and prevention so the drug of choice is uh, mebendazole so uh, we usually uh, give uh, this particular drug to the patient for three days okay at intervals of twice per day so 100 milligrams twice for three days albendazole and uh, albendazole is actually an alternative, okay? Uh, Anti-helmetic drugs. For the pre uh, prevention, wash framework should be uh, followed, no? especially um, with uh, access to proper uh, sanitation. For the epidemiology of trichuris trichura, this is more common in temperate and tropical countries but is more widely distributed in warm, moist areas of the world. So, example of this, of course, is the Philippines. So, worldwide, there are 604 to 795 million affected with the age group that is more predisposed to this particular parasite ranges from 5 to 15 years of age. So, According to data, okay, around 19.1% uh, okay, of in, uh, trichuris infection may co-infect with ascaris infections. This is due to the fact that ascaris and trichuris are both soil-transmitted helmets. So, most of the time, around 19%, this can also uh, be seen in the microscope no? or together with the ascaris and trichuris infection. So, aside from ascaris and trichuris, hookworms are also soil-transmitted 
helminths. No? Here is a sample picture of these three. So, um, the, these are dubbed as the unholy trinity kasi usually, these can be seen okay, simultaneously in one stool sample, especially if the patient has uh, a chronic okay, um, parasitic infection. So, the last intestinal roundworms under a fasmid is your Capillaria philippinensis. So, this is one of the four Capillaria species that are known to infect humans. So, human infection with Capillaria usually uh, is actually uh, first recorded in um, Luzon, okay? Or uh, specifically in Ilocos region in uh, northern Luzon. So, this was first reported by Chitwood et al. in 1963. Hence, the uh, species name Philippinensis. So, this is also known as the Pudok worm. And, ayan, uh, I have uh, already uh, discussed this. So, it's first reported by Chitwood et al. No? This, uh, the patient is from a 29-year-old male from northern Luzon, Ilocos, which uh, accidentally ingested the larva okay, of the parasite present in the tissues of small fishes. So usually this is acquired via ingestion of the contaminated uh, tissue okay, or uh, contaminated tissue of uh, fishes, no? especially mga undercooked uh, fish. And this is uh, considered to be an apasmid, so that means it does not contain any caudal chemoreceptors in their uh, posterior regions. Uh, acquired, okay, through eating undercooked fish. And in terms of their ova, the egg of this parasite is usually similar in morphology to Trichuris trichura. But remember, in size, these are smaller. So, these are guitar, peanut uh, shape with striated shells, and a flattened bipolar plugs. So, sometimes it, um, when two parasites, especially Trichuris and Capillaria, are seen in one stool sample, ayan, sometimes the, uh, we can uh, misidentify this no? since these are very similar. For the adult worm, most of the time for Capillaria philippinensis, uh, their anterior portion are thin and filamentous. No? So that means they have slightly uh, thinner um, portions than their posterior counterpart. So in a posterior, usually in their tail region, this is slightly thicker and shorter. Uh, their esophagus usually contains rows of stico sites. So what are these stichocytes? These are glandular unicellular cells. No? So these are arranged usually in a row along the posterior portion of their esophagus. So what is the purpose of these stichocytes? So usually this uh, purpose is uh, quite uh, not well explained in our book but according to other sources, these uh, functions as secretory. No? So this uh, secretes alpha and beta granules that can uh, help the, uh, the particular parasite in their surroundings and of course in their survival. So only trichinella uh, among your uh, nematodes which has that particular stichocytes no? or cells. Your stichosome is the accumulation of your stichocytes. No? So mas general itong uh, term na ito. For the male, these are slightly smaller at around 1.5 to 3.9 millimeters in length. The male also has a male uh, spicule or in their copulatory bursa where they attach themselves during copulation uh, to the female. No? So it's around 230 to 300 micrometers long and has an un unspined sheet. For the female, this is uh, larger, and the vulva in females is located at the junction and at, of anterior or middle thirds of the parasite. So here is an example of the stichocytes present in their esophagus. So uh, these types of uh, cells or glandular cells that are arranged in rows no? along the junction of your esophagus. For the life cycle of Capillaria philippinensis, the mode of transmission is through ingestion, sorry, na double. So, it's through ingestion of infective larva, which is the uh, infective stage, uh, through contaminated undercooked fish. No? So, usually, uh, people who loves eating uh, fresh meat, uh, uh, fresh fish meat, such as sushi, or uh, if you're familiar in sa mga, lalo na sa Ilocos region, yung kinilaw, okay? Most of the time, these uh, people are predisposed to acquiring this type of parasite. 
So the habitat of the uh, adult worms usually resides in the small intestine. For the infective stage, this is what we call the infective larva, especially seen in the tissues of uh, infective fishes. The agnostic stage is usually the egg, but it's very important to differentiate this to the trichuris egg. Adults can be used as well. And for the definitive host, the natural definitive host of capillaria is usually birds, but humans can also act as definitive host. No? So when we say definitive incidental host, so we are not the natural host of this particular parasite, but we can be extra or as an incidental due to accidentally acquiring the larval form of the parasite. Freshwater fishes are the intermediate host of the parasite. So that means these nematode, especially their larval forms, are seen in freshwater fishes such as your ipon, berot, bagsa, bagsang, and bagto. So these are species of fishes present in that area. So here is the life cycle of Capillaria philippinensis. So it starts off with the unembryonated egg being passed down in the stool. Okay, by the suspected infected host. No? It may be a bird or a human. So, uh, if the unembryonated egg are exposed to water, this will embryonate okay, and develop to contain the infective larva. So, these infective forms of the egg is now uh, ingested by our intermediate host, which is the freshwater fishes. So these freshwater fishes will act as the intermediate host. No? So that means they harbor the larval stage of the parasite. So this particular parasite inside the fish will migrate to the small intestine and uh, to the tissues of your intermediate host, your freshwater fish. So humans and birds, are, uh, which are your natural host, uh, get infected with this parasite when the fish is eaten and cooked. No? So the larva will escape from the fish, or especially the tissue of the fish, and um, migrate to the small intestine to develop into adult worms. So adult worms of Capillary Philippinensis uh, may have chances of producing embryonated eggs already. So uh, just like we have discussed a while ago, when an egg is embryonated, so they can fully develop in, uh, as larva inside the human host. No? So auto-infection is very possible in this type of scenario. So the pathology behind Capillary Philippinensis is only focused in our intestine. No? So this is what we call the intestinal capillariasis. So this is what we call mystery disease. So later on I'll explain why is it called the mystery disease. But the mystery disease is associated with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and borborygmi. So when you say borborygmi, this is the gurgling sound no, of our stomach. So signs and symptoms usually manifest especially at moderate to chronic stages. So intermittent diarrhea is um, evident. Weight loss malaise or the overall pain okay in a certain area of our body anorexia vomiting and edema are all signs and symptoms okay with people infected with capillaria so here are the other lab findings that we can use to uh, associate the disease okay to the parasite so kindly take note na lang so, also in our pathology, the large number of worms that develop in humans is responsible for the severe pathology. So, usually the parasites do not invade the intestinal tissue, but they are responsible for micro ulcers in the epithelium. So, that's why I explained a while ago uh, the, these, type, uh, these micro, ep micro ulcers in the epithelium of our intestinal tract causes leakage of certain uh, nutrients. No? And these are uh, and the compressive degeneration and mechanical compression of cells usually happens within this uh, time frame. So homogeneous materials is also seen at the anterior end of the worm by electron microscopy. So the ulcerative and degenerative lesions in the intestinal mucosa may account for malabsorption of fluid, protein, and electrolytes. For the laboratory diagnosis of Capillaria philippinensis, this is based on finding or on the finding characteristic of eggs in the feces. So our main specimen here would be the stool. Duodenal aspirate may also be used in cases of inaccurate stool results. 
So aside from the eggs, uh, there may also be uh, various larval stages of the parasite that can be extracted, no? as well as the adult worms in the feces. In terms of the method, we can use the conventional direct fecal smear to identify the eggs or the larva as well and at the adults of the particular parasite. We can also use concentration techniques in cases of low intensity infection and uh, these are very um, highly um, complicated procedures but we have what we call the enzyme link immunosorbent assay. So usually this uh, uses antibodies to detect no, the presence of uh, we detect the presence of antibodies created okay, against the parasite. So this most of the time, this uses serum instead of stool sample. For the treatment and prevention, the uh, drug of choice is mebendazole. So this is uh, given twice per day at 200 mg for 20 days. Albendazole is also uh, applicable or as an alternative treatment and for severe cases, there, I there needs to be an intervention no, or a supplementative intervention such as giving electrolyte uh, replacement and uh, giving okay, the patient high protein diet since nga nagkaroon ng loss of protein and electrolytes during the course of the disease. Prevention, this is still a um, under the wash framework but so intestinal capillarisis was firstly discovered in northern Luzon in the Philippines so this was in the year 1966 where an epidemic in Barangay Pudok West Tagidin Ilocos Sur was reported so the spread okay of uh, an unknown diarrheic uh, infection was noted no in case uh, the cases usually is, uh, reached 1000 and 77 deaths were recorded. But nowadays, uh, cases of human capillarisis are also now reported in Thailand, Iran, Japan, and other neighboring countries. So it is so-called mystery disease because uh, this is not documented in any other textbooks or references. So the first case was actually discovered in the Philippines. So that is all for our lecture in intestinal nematodes. So here are all the references. Thank you and good day.